changed their preferences, they shifted towards more durable goods in their consumption baskets, the metal intensity of an economy rises. The alternative school was the leapfrogging school, which was very optimistic about technological change. And they argued that consumers can do what they like. The power of technological change enables economies to leap onto lower intensity of use curves and it's that dynamic which actually drives reduced metal intensity through time as opposed to increased metal intensity through time as the consumer preferences school contended. Now this was the state of play until the early 1990s uh, when a synthesis view was adopted. Uh, similar time series that I showed you previously, I've cut it off in 1960 now and there was another spike in the early 1990s, another spike in interest, but at this point um, there was a groundbreaking study which actually married the two schools. And they said, you're both right, consumer preferences um, are statistically significant in terms of metal intensity, but they also said that technological change is statistically significant. And you have to live with both views of the world. One is pulling you up, one is pulling you down, and the trick is finding the balance between the two. Now, what are we doing in our paper? Well, first of all, we want to verify that the synthesis view still holds. But that initial paper had a few uh, limitations. It only looked at low-income economies. It only looked at a very uh, compressed period of history. And it only looked at GDP per capita in terms of explanatory variables. So with our study, we wanted to extend the explanatory data. We wanted to extend the sample in terms of economies. We wanted to extend the sample in terms of the time period. And we wanted to extend the estimation technique beyond the simplest form of regression, i.e. linear, ordinary least squares, and go beyond that to capture what was inherently a non-linear relationship. And we also wanted to move away from intensity of use, which is basically the amount of metal which is consumed to produce one unit of GDP. We wanted to shift the debate to per capita space, because per capita uh, scaling to us will enable us to put our new Kuznets curve for steel out there is another development metric uh, next to those other development metrics which people tend to focus on. Whereas intensity of use, an inherently supply side and static phenomenon, uh, we think is not something which gives you a great feel uh, for the living standards which are actually pervading in, an, in a country. So beyond intensity of use and onto the Kuznets curve for steel. And what is that? Well. It's an upside down U shape in steel use per capita and income per capita space. You're probably all familiar with the original Kuznets curve, which was about income distribution. You're probably also quite familiar with the environmental Kuznets curve, which would have a measure of uh, pollution on the vertical axis. And it would also have that upside down U shape, the inverted U. Well, this is our data on steel use per capita, and you can see that the inverted U uh, is there. Um, this is not a cross-section, by the way. This is not a snapshot in time. These are time series of individual economies, in many cases going all the way back to 1890. So what we're trying to do is capture the most rapid phase of industrialization in all countries that have gone through a relevant industrialization phase. We're not just saying this is a snapshot, here are some low-income economies, here are some middle-income economies, here are some high-income economies, what's the relationship at this point in time? We want to capture the path from A to B to C. We don't just want to be told where they are based upon what could be a unique rather than generalizable moment for the global economy. Now, what are the data we're using? Well, uh, I've already said we wanted to extend beyond GDP per capita to explain what was going on here. Uh, we're using urbanisation numbers, we're using propensities to invest, propensities to trade, propensities to motorise, 
and propensities to electrify. Uh, all uh, variables which we think intuitively should be related to steel demand, should be related to economic development and can actually explain GDP per capita just as they can explain the steel demand itself. Now, uh, this is the raw material, if you like, in terms of the country paths for steel, in, for steel uh, demand per head. Uh, and once again, uh, 1890 is the starting point for the first and second generation industrialisers. Uh, you can see there that uh, the more spectacular paths have been traced by East Asian economies, uh, Japan, uh, Korea and Taiwan, who have uh, got both the highest peaks and uh, the longest maintenance of peaks uh, in this sample. But uh, we also pay a lot of attention to the United States, uh, who has uh, the best data and uh, the, uh, the most faithful reflection, if you like, of the inverted U-shape over a long period of time, the US being the heavy black line. So how did we try and bring this all together? Well, rather than just having a single equation and using linear techniques, we have simultaneous estimation uh, in uh, non-linear space. And we use GDP per head, its squared term, a proxy for the leapfrogging hypothesis, and proxies for the consumer preferences uh, hypothesis. And as I said, our key explanatory variables for GDP itself, urbanisation, investment, trading, propensity, we substitute results from, sub, from equation two back into equation one, and we are then endogenising the whole process rather than imposing a lot of things from the outside and having our assumptions colour our results. And the results themselves are that uh, the Kuznets curve for steel was uh, very robustly validated and the synthesis view was also updated with more extended data, a more extended sample and once again validated very robustly. Uh, now these are very pleasing results and uh, I think I can stand here and rather say it's an interesting paper, please read it. Uh, this year I'd say it's an important paper, you, you must read it uh, and uh, I mean that very sincerely. Uh, and fr from that point forward we had a framework for looking at China and projecting forward and the, uh, the results which we came up with here is that uh, we think that Chinese steel use per head is going to peak somewhere between 700 and 800 kilograms per head at a level of GDP per head of roughly 15,500 US dollars. Now, in isolation, that probably doesn't mean all that much to you. Uh, but ooh. just give you some context for that. If you look at a 2008 base of GDP per capita of around about five and a half thousand US dollars, we're using 1990 international US dollars, this, this leaping off point will change depending on uh, how you're assembling your comparative series. Basically, per capita income has to triple from its 2008 level to hit that target at which we assess steel demand will peak. So it will have to triple before peak intensity is attained. Now if you use historical rates of growth to uh, cast forward to pick a time, well, if you take the 1980 to 2008 average, we're talking a peak in 2024, and if you go for the post-1990 pace, somewhat earlier, 2021. Uh, certainly nothing which is happening in the next couple of weeks. So the the structural elements of uh, the Chinese growth story as they pertain to resource demand are going to be strengthening considerably over the course of this next cycle. Uh, whilst the cyclical momentum in the Chinese economy is actually quite weak right now, uh, I think that uh, the structural underpinnings of the economy remain very much in place. Whilst the cycle will probably win the tussle over the next 12 months or so, this structural underpinning will certainly reassert itself uh, 
relatively soon. And another point which we think is quite, uh, quite uh, interesting is that, uh, and we've heard a lot today about uh, the change uh, between uh, the Lewis turning point to the Lewis turning period. Uh, those of you who haven't followed the debate over years, this is not semantics. This is uh, a very, very important distinction. And our projections actually indicate that China's Kuznets curve for steel is very flat around its peaks. It doesn't go very steeply to its apex and then drop away very swiftly. We actually anticipate that steel demand will be at or about its peak level for a considerable period either side of the actual peak. Now, that's also very important. This is not going to be, as I said, an abrupt deceleration. And as you can see here, if I just trip out the Asian countries, uh, Japan certainly hasn't gone through a, uh, a dramatic fall away from its peak level of steel demand. It's held that level for a considerable period of time. And Taiwan and Korea appear to be heading along a very similar path. China's acceleration is still very much ahead of it, but when that peak does arrive, we aren't expecting an abrupt fall off, and that is very good news for a resource leveraged economy like ours. This is the path itself, and you will see many of those points I've uh, been making, a relatively uh, flat top uh, and a very gradual uh, easing off in uh, steel use per head going forward. One of the key reasons for this is uh, the distortions in the labour market we've been talking about uh, has actually held back China's urbanisation rate relative to its current level of income. China's urbanisation rate could very well be could significantly higher if labour was free to move uh, as it would. Uh, so the fact that the urbanisation rate continues to rise for a considerable period into the projection space really does influence uh, what we think about steel demand over the, uh, over the course of, uh, of many decades. And uh, as I've said, we're talking uh, 2024 based upon a 7% compound rate of GDP per capita. There are lots of challenges facing China. Growth is going to be harder to come by in the coming decade than the decades that have, we've just come through. And therefore, if you want to uh, you know, pick one confidence interval or other here, perhaps you pick a flatter trajectory, but a flatter trajectory does not change your expectation of where the peak ought to be in level terms. It just means you reach it later and you get there in a less abrupt way. Uh, I will conclude by making just a couple of points now. Uh, despite the fact that we think that uh, China isn't going to go all the way to the steel demand per head, which uh, Taiwan and Korea and others have shown us is possible, uh, that doesn't mean that we are not optimistic about long-run growth prospects. The point is that we don't think China is small enough, or basically it's too big, to continually expand market share globally uh, where a smaller economy like a Korea or Taiwan can slip under the radar, if you like. So we think that China's share of uh, tradables goods markets globally will saturate uh, well ahead of where a Korea or a Taiwan would reach a saturation point. And therefore, China will have to change its strategy earlier and uh, more profoundly than other East Asian industrialisers. But we aren't pessimistic about growth. We think this transition can be achieved. And we've heard many, many uh, prescriptions today about how that might, uh, might be brought about. We see it as very much about prioritising domestic demand and rebalancing the distribution of income. And there's a list of uh, sectors which we see as excessively privileged right now. Uh, and we've matched them to a sector which we think uh, is not getting enough support. And uh, it's not a short list. So the challenges are large, but uh, we think that the trajectory itself uh, remains very, very favourable for 
a country like Australia. Thank you. Thanks, Hugh. So rising steel demand and rising resource and energy demand, good news for Australia. Good news for the Chinese who, among their hundreds of millions, will own their first car in the next 20 years, but not good news for the environment. And our next speaker, where's he gone? Hey. Zhongxiang Zheng. We're very fortunate to have Zhongxiang come all the way from Honolulu, lucky him, the East West Centre. He's an expert on environmental economics. He also holds adjunct professorships at Peking University, the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences and the Chinese Academy of Science as well. So he's very f well placed to talk to us about how China is going to achieve some of its environmental objectives. Uh, thank you. Thank you for very kind introductions. It's always a great pleasure for me to come here to share some of my, my thoughts about uh, you know, China energy conservation and uh, China recent uh, uh, pledge for reduced carbon intensity for the year 2020s. Uh, yesterday, you know, when you have this uh, uh, China ambassador uh, uh, to address the launch of the, uh, the, launch of the book, and uh, the uh, you know, China ambassador mentioned that the China did many things, but is you know not really out no to outside. So, particularly related to the energy efficiency improvement and related to use of renewable energy. So that means for my talk, the first two, I will address the first two issues which reached the China investors to give you some perspective to see what really China has done in recent years. And uh, you know that is our fo focus on the, the what the country has done to date. Then we. Will move on to see what China, we could expect from China in the future. So that was the China proposal to reduce carbon intensity by 40 to 45 percent in the year 2020s. So we would have some evaluation whether this really is ambitious or is just a representative of business euro. And because the commitment is in the carbon intensity, this means that energy use per carbon intensity per unit of GDP, so that means both data about <coughs> emission and, uh, and uh, economic acti activity both are matters. So that will come down some aesthetic issues, really the, you know, the, the key risk issue of the credibility of the statistics about the GDP and energy consumptions. And uh, this morning the professor uh, uh, Zhang is uh, from the DRC, is talk about the, you know, is the central provincial government leadership and, uh, and this actually is also how uh, you know, a significant implication in the energy conservation and the pollution cutting. So then I will put some uh, talk here, and finally to draw some uh, conclusions. Uh, you know, is uh, uh, you know the China, the you know, those that get great concern about the uh, emissions, and this is a uh, estimation from the U.S. Department of Energy. Information nutrition estimate as recent as 2004 to say that China would not catch up the United States until the 2030s. So that was expectation in the year 2004. And but unfortunately, and because there is increasing, uh, increasing the energy intensity uh, in China since 2002, and that is actually the China already becomes the world number one carbon meter in 2007s. So this increasing energy intensity since 2002 put China in a very awful position, both in globally in terms of the, you know, the climate change and regarding the China commitment. And actually it's also put China very awfully domestically because you have increasing energy demand and that also particular you know, demand for oil, oil and risk of energy securities, huge, environmental pro, pro, huge domestic environmental problem. So for that reason, the government said this uh, first time set this uh, target for the reduced energy in intensity in the first time in the national fire plan cut the required cut and intensity by 20 percent from 2006 to 2000 uh, from 2010 and uh, that is uh, you know is uh, to achieve that goal the government uh, implement a number of policies and some are the very more broad uh, cover some are more specific and here is, you know, is a kind of trade policy. Usually, before was promoting something else, but now those days also using for the energy conservation and the carbon emissions, and you know something like, uh, you know, carbon, uh, no, is a export tariff, export rebate, export tax, which are promote this uh, uh, energy efficient products and trying to cut this 
uh, uh, less energy efficient uh, products. And one of the things that is also that uh, you know, Professor Li Gangsong this morning talked about a lot of China trade is uh, uh, called the manufacturer process trade. This is actually also how implication here is, uh, and uh, there is one policy was implemented recent year, basically say that they will suspend those enterprise which engage trade. If you always don't meet the environment regulation, they will suspend this right. And here I showed the one study say that uh, you know Delta uh, Delta River in China that was where the you know the uh, increased a lot of the trade. And uh, you will see that uh, like Shenzhen and uh, almost 89 percent, which emission, which is actually can relate to the manu uh, manufacture processing trade. So that means that the policy which you mentioned that if it really can be implemented, could have very positive impact. And uh, specifically, they also have some focus on the policy side, because industry and the consumer 70 percent of energy use, and so is how industry doing how will significant impact for the country meet target. So in that case, the government has set up the so-called 10,000 energy conservation program, basically pick up about 1,000 larger corporations which consume about one-third of nat national energy consumption, half of energy use in industry sectors. So they ask all this enterprise to help accountable for the energy use. And uh, you know, the natural sector those days also are con consuming more and more energy, so at least consume over 20 percent. So now it requires all this, uh, you know, the new building in the uh, cold areas, uh, very cold areas, has to be 50 percent more efficient since 2006 uh, compared to what the building in the early uh, 1980s. And for large cities, new building has at least to be 65 percent compared with the, the building was built uh, in the uh, early, nine, early 80s. And uh, you all know that you know China the electricity most of them are from uh, coal-fired powers, and uh, many of which are small signs of a coal-fired power plant. The government take a strict efforts trying to close all these uh, small, less efficient uh, coal-fired power plant, and they set a target of 50 gigawatt of a small coal-fired power has to be closed and, uh, during during year 2006-2010, and to put that into perspective, actually the China. Uh, closed the small uh, uh, coal-fired power during the previous five years only 8.36 gigawatt. So that means the, the new target 50 is much higher, and and that is uh, by the end of the 2000 uh, by end of uh, June 2009. And actually, China already meet this target. This means one and a half years ahead of the national set target for the for this one. And, uh, you know, as the country is also developing more and more people have a car, and uh, so this is also caused a lot of issues. And for that reason, government also set this uh, differentiation the excise tax for the, for the car with different, different agent size. So those large, larger cars, those states are heavily taxed, so to try to promote people to use the small, efficient cars. And the country also set a very high fuel efficient standards, uh, you see that the, the standard new car, which are produced in China, sold in China, those days the efficient standards, fuel efficient standards even higher than U.S. and Australia, of course still lower than Japan and, uh, and the EU. So, so far we talk about the, what the done, country has done in energy conservation, and now let's say a little bit about the, what the country has been doing on the renewable energy side. And the country set a very ambitious goal that they're trying to increase the share of renewable energy in total energy uh, consumption from 80% in 2006 to 50% uh, by year 2020s. And, uh, and when we talk about renewable, well, people always refer to EU because EU considered a leader in the renewable energies. So for, for that reason, I like to compare what China is doing compared with EU. Basically, you see that uh, this number shows that both China and EU will double their shares from current to the, to the futures. And it looks like the EU is more efficient because the EU will increase to 20%. But the point is because the China energy use grows three times faster than EU use, energy use. So that means if you want to increase your share, similar double your shares, that means the renewable energy in China has to be grow four times than that of EU. So that's the, the, as far as the, on the paper look, the China target is much more ambitious than EU doing. 
and the country is not only you know, set ambitious goal, but even more important to take really efforts to achieve that goals. And those days, you know, a lot of discussions to see who is leading and winning the clean energy race. But at least you see the country put a lot of investment in clean energies. And the last year, the China invest in clean energy two times than what the U.S. doing. And in terms of the percentage of GDP in the in the clean energy investment, China is about three times than what the second largest investor in the United States. And uh, the, you know, the country, with the renewable energies, and China pick up wind power as their priorities. And you do see that uh, all the years, the, you know, the, the new addition of China in the wind power capacity go very substantially. And uh, it was almost double the new addition every f past five years. Now is uh, by end of the last year, by end of 2009, China is slightly already over than second one, German. Now is. Uh, look like on the way to catch the United States. And, uh, no, and before is also the, oh, the domestic wind market, which are all dominated by the foreign turbines from Germany, from Spain, from the Denmark. Nowadays, actually, is, uh, by 2008, is, uh, oh, the three big China uh, uh, turbine manufacturers actually is already accounted more than half of the, world, of the domestic market. So, so far we talk about the country has done and about the new energy. I will give some relation about a little bit, uh, uh, you know, the evaluation later on when we will come to uh, the, the next topic. So it, it is about now we look at what we could expect from China in the future. So this was the government official announcement, uh, this uh, emission intensity target 40 to 45 by year 2020s. So when this is released, there are a lot of huge discussion to see about uh, whether it's ambitious, and whether it's just business euro, China government certainly considers it very ambitious, but as many you know, as Western scholars consider it just business euros. So there are several ways to look at this. One is to see whether this proposed target is as challenging as the energy freezing goal set in the current 11 five year plan. That was, I mentioned, 20% energy freezing goal from 2006 to 2010. You know, is uh, uh, there, there are two factors which actually already positive contribution to the energy intensive indicator uh, for, uh, to, to contribute the positive to the energy intensity indicator. Uh, one is, you know, you know, is China recent years to revise the GDP upward and, you know, then have more revised GDP and also uh, uh, revise the uh, uh, service share in the total GDP. Both actually is uh, this revision positive to the indicator GDP. Although the country is not calculated for, for, for make that indicator look good, but in practice that is the case. Another one is, you know, we talk about this uh, small, less efficient coal power. This usually we consider is low hanging fruit. So this kind of thing you only can be catched once, you know. So that means it takes even these two indicate uh, factors which are more favorable to China for the achieve the target, even those and then plus the so all very you know impress, impressive with this energy efficiency measure what we did in I'm just imagine. But in reality is what we see that the, what the China has accomplished is that the China only accomplished chief with energy intensive reduction ten percent during the first three years. So that means if a country wants to meet the target in the next for the whole five years, for the next two years you have to achieve exactly what you have achieved in the previous three years. So you do see that means the, you know oh, there are many already positive factors contribute to that indicator, but you see it's still very hard to meet. So that means the current physical current five year plan and the target is very very challenging. Then the proposed new and intensity target, which will and the additional 20 to 25 percent. So then you would say that is really challenging for country to, to, to meet. And another way to look at this is how substantially this carbon, the new carbon intensity target will drive down China emission below the so-called business, uh, uh, business euro projections and also whether China does its own part required to fulfill the global commitment to you know, stabilize the emission concentration and the design levels. And to put this into perspective, I'd like to give you some number because now I'm talking about China and give some comments about China numbers. Usually I wouldn't 
uh, you know, is uh, get any number from China myself, and also don't want to get any number from the United States because I'm already come from in, uh, China. I'm working in the United States, so I just want to use some uh, number from a third party and trying to put this, uh, you know, the things in the more objective ways. And this is a recently estimation from uh, international energy indices. They published at the end of last year about the world energy outlook. Basically, they say that the carbon emission in China and the baseline level is about 9.6, uh, uh, you know, the gigaton. And then they have a policy scenario which is basically trying to control the temperature below uh, two degrees, that was IPC recommended, this is so-called 450 ppm scenarios. For that one, uh, if you want to meet that global goal, China mission has to be controlled to 8.4 gigatons. And now let's we put the China 40 to 40 pi intensity of target into perspective. And if the China meet this 40 to 45 goal, then China emission will be cut from baseline level uh, uh, to uh, by 0.46 to 1.2 and uh, into percentage so that means 4.8 to 12.7 below the baseline. So that means that even the low end is not the business euro because at least you will cut about almost 5%. Five, five if China can meet the high end which China proposed, so then we will cut the emission by 1.2 gigatons. That was exactly required for China to do in the very ambitious global scenario for PP 450 billion. So if you take these two point of view, I would argue that, you know, the, the proposal from China certainly is not business euros. And then we will see whether the next question is whether there is some room for country to further, further go on. And uh, because from China's side, they certainly would argue that as long as they meet this 40 percent, they said they will meet the goal. But uh, if you look at the IEA studies, they have, uh, you know, they look at many policies which China already taken before they announced this, uh, uh, make this intensive announcement. So that policy work together will cut the emission by one gig tons. That means that the carbon intensity reduction will 43.6 percentage. So that means if you look at the low end, 40 percent, but this is already 43. So that sense that uh, certainly see that the low end of China commitment is a little bit conservative. Do you think that 3.6 percent matter? Yes, because the China emission by 2020 will at least 28 percent global. So that means 3.6 percent reduction in China will translate at least 10 percent reduction globally. And so then we see that what uh, can go beyond this, and certainly will be hard. But it's not possible. What I just mentioned that you know the, all the policy which are already taken, which already can cut emissions substantially. But all this policy be proposed by China uh, is have nothing to do with climate because they are not proposed motivated by climate change. But if you consider climate change into consideration, then you will enact some additional policy that will bring down additional emission reductions. So I did some. Uh, back of envelope calculation and to see China can probably reduce the emission intensity by 46 to 50 percent. And the, what they mean by that is, you know, there is IPCC recommendation for developing country. Basically, say for developing country, you have to cut your carbon intensity, carbon emission by 15 to 30 percent below the, your baseline levels. So if China can reduce this carbon intensity reduction target by 46 to 50 percent, so that means China total emission level will be cut to, uh, below the baseline 15 to 21 levels. So that will put China well within the IPPC recommended levels. So now let's, uh, you know, is uh, uh, move on to talk a little bit about because the China commitment is uh, is the carbon intensity. That understand both the carbon emissions and energy use and all the GDP data matter for the credibility because there are many ways to measure credibility and at least one of credibility is all about your numbers. And so I, I look at the statistics and to see that usually, you know, the statistics is you first initially report your figure and later on you revise. Now you do see the energy consumption figures in the, in the late 1980s in the later 90s, that was the initial value 
and, and compared with the final value, there is a huge revision, 8 to 13 percent revisions. But all these years, actually this revision already, first reported value already very close to what is the final value. So that means here, basically <coughs> trying to say that any numbers is it, okay because the revision is not that, that big. But, but if you look at the, what revision in the GDP, and now we have this, uh, back to my original question, we have this GDP and uh, energy intensive number for, the, uh, for this 11, 50, 11 five year plan. And this is originally, you know, if you look in the 2006, the originally report number, then you compare with the final values, then you find the differential is almost 46 percent. You know, just by revising figures for this uh, 2006, 2008, you end up almost 100 percent, you know, difference. So that means, you know, this kind of uh, numbers is very, very, have a huge implication both for China meet the energy intensive target and also for future carbon intensive target. So that's why this is a, a very great concern for Western world about, you know, the, whether China is able to open for consultation about this kind of number. Otherwise, you know, the carbon intensive target, target doesn't mean that much because it, you just revise these kind of things then you end up with very different from what you originally reported. And now I finally, to, 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 to mention a few things about the, uh, you know, the relationship between the, relationship between the central government and local government. And um, because in those days, over the last 30 years, that economic reform and already devote the decision making to the, uh, to the local government. And so the, how local government doing very crucial to meet the, you know, any kind of the goal which central government set. And, uh, you know, of course, you know, this has something to do with the evaluation criteria and, uh, and those days, um, you know, evaluation more focused on the GDP and uh, so everything equal, you, if you drive your local GDP high, you get uh, more chance to be promotion. So that means the government certainly have to change this kind of evaluation criteria they are doing, but it probably takes time. But what I want to say is I like to back to the issue which the Professor Trump mentioned in the morning, talk about is the physical issues. And uh, this is how a huge implication in the environment areas. And because this, uh, you know, the tax uh, sharing system changing from 1904, then you find the share of the uh, revenue of, from central government or the total government revenue is doubled from, you know, 1993 to 1994. But in the meantime, the uh, expenditure from a central government compared with total government expenditures, you know, doesn't just increase 2%. And this is more or less cases uh, similar all the years. So that you end up with the local government, how much revenue and to support many activities. So that is to some extent this is objective reason for local government because they have, they have nothing choice but to, to look at GDPs. So that reason we needed to really look at some financial and incentive to get the local government cooperation to achieve your, you know, to achieve your energy and carbon intensive target. I imagine here one of the incentives we really have central government how to think about how to elevate the financial burden of and the local government is revenue to incent them not to only eye on the economic growth. And one of the things we mentioned here is, you know, is, uh, and, uh, is a so-called is uh, resource tax. So far, and this is uh, only cover seven uh, resources and uh, basically done based on the, uh, the, the quantity is extracted, not by the price. And uh, so the positive things, they start this uh, reform since uh, June in the Xinjiang, and they also uh, you start this reform and they will levy the, the, the result tax based on the revenue rather than the quantitative. So then you find this, I did some rough calculation to see what the impact in terms of government, local government revenues. And they currently, and the revenue from natural resources from Xinjiang, based on the current way, is only about 3.8%. By implementing this new reform annually, the local government revenue from resources will be 50% at least, could be go to 20%. So that is certainly the way to help local government to reduce the financial burden, they might be thinking some other. Otherwise, there's no other ways for them to, you know, to purely look at the environment issues without uh, thinking about the economic growth. 
Uh, I'm not going to talk about you know, uh, conclusion here. I just use, like using my last many minutes, I want to speak one another thing is, is, is uh, you know, we talk about the China commitment, it's carbon intensities. And so as long as the commitment is about the, you know, intensities, both energy and the GDP data matters. And so, so this is a lot of a concern. And, uh, and also is, as long as you have this carbon intensive target, doesn't matter how China says ambitious or not, they always raise the question, you know, this kind of carbon tariff from EU, from the United States. Because your commitment is different from what the US is doing, different from the EU doing. They always put China in the very difficult position to defend yourself. So that reason, and also I would say that China could think about the other ways. And one of the things I think is that there is a huge flaw in the current international negotiation. It means that you, should, you see why the fl could not make it in the Copenhagen. And if you continue to follow the current trends, I wouldn't think they will go any further. One of the things I think the flaw is current negotiation mainly focused on the year 2020s and 2050s. But you see the 2020 is almost there, is uh, in a few years away, and uh, this, this 2020 is not coming well for two large emitters. For the United States, because the U.S. withdraw from protocols, basically it's over the last 10 years, the U.S. done nothing, didn't do much things compared with EU, compared with Japan. So now you ask them to take the very strict commitment what developing countries ask for, there's no possible at all in the United States, to be honest with you. Even on moral ground, the U.S. do something, but practically that, imp that is impossible at all. From China's side, because country still are developing, and you know the resources they use, emissions still go high. And the, uh, my previous speaker that you see the peak for steel will be in the middle of the 20s. And so, if you ask them to, you know, have the emission cap in the 2020, that is also very unrealistic. So then, my point is, uh, if negotiation. Instead of focusing on the year 2020, and if you focus on the 2030s, that is possible that the country China and US will be committed in the same manner, but in a different magnitude. And uh, President Obama made an announcement about the US target just before he headed to four uh, Copenhagen meetings. And he, you know, he proposed the US emission target 70%. Certainly, he will, the US target is well below what expectation for U.S. from other countries. So then he also proposed that the U.S. will cut emission by 42% in the year 2030s. And uh, maybe the present days just want to show the U.S. leadership, but uh, in, eventually he pointed to the right di direction. So it really means we need to look at the 2030s. I wrote a paper and uh, look at many, many uh, things to say that uh, 2030 is probably the year that China also come to threshold to have a mission camp. And the U.S., because it's still 20 years away, so still possible to have more significant emission cut. So that means if you move negotiation in, instead of focusing on 2020 and focusing on 2030s, then possible, then can we have some kind of agreement, bring the two large emitter and make commitment in the same, same manner. So this is my suggestion and direction for the current international negotiations. Thank you. Thanks. I guess the big question is whether we can survive that long through to 2030. Um, next up, we've got Jing Jun Xue. He's a professor at Nagoya University, and he's done research on development, economics, in income inequality, and also environmental economics. So he's very well placed to talk to us about China's great turning points. We've already heard a couple of turning points today or turning periods, thinking about the labor surplus, but also that of steel demand. So let's hope that Jing Jun has some solutions. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Dan. Uh, I'm very happy here, and especially very happy to uh, give a presentation. And you are hosting, because last year, I remember here, you hosted the session, the same session, and uh, give a talk about uh, low carbon economy in China. And also, I may shorten my uh, speech here because I travel from Tokyo to here, I used uh, about eight hours. And uh, uh, Zhang, <laughs> Zhang, Professor Zhang used uh, 20 hours to travel from Honolulu to here. So I may give time to him and shorten my speech here. 
but it is very hard work for me to do uh, to talk something. The, uh, uh, the title of the conference is uh, uh, you know, China's Reform and uh, Development in next uh, 20 years. I have only 20 minutes. So I have to talk about 20 years things in 20 minutes. So one minute, one year. <laughs> so I have to hurry. Okay, so I will give you a summary, I'll give a word word, uh, a word view about the, uh, what will happen in the next uh, 20 years in China. And my uh, speech will uh, contain uh, several uh, cont uh, contents. One is uh, China will be approaching to five major turning points in the next 20 years. Uh, well, either it's a kind of a turning point or, or period, it's the same thing, I think. Uh, firstly, the industrial structure turning point. So the Chinese economy now is focusing on manufacturing uh, sector. So China has become the, uh, the world factory, also the world market. So that means uh, manufacturing is a major industry, major uh, uh, part of the economy now. But in the next 20 years, there will be change. And the second one is the so-called very popular topic of a Lewis turning point, um, labor migration. This morning, uh, Professor Meng Xin uh, talked a lot about that. I will uh, talk a little about that. Also, this is uh, uh, something relating to uh, the industrial structure change, also relating to uh, the next uh, 20 years China's economic growth, so how China will uh, face uh, the, the, uh, the, the wage rise or something like that or the shortage of skilled, uh, skilled labor. The third one is the so-called income Kuznets curve. This is my favorite thing because I'm doing service in China and also doing some uh, uh, study on this issue. Uh, income uh, distribution is closely related to the so-called Lewis point because uh, migrants uh, move from countryside to cities because that is a big, a huge gap between uh, cities and uh, urban area, uh, rural area. So my, my three point was to do that. And fourth point is that, uh, that Kuznets turning point. This is environment issue. Uh, Professor Zhang Zhongxiang talked something already, uh, but I will give you a, a shape of the so-called Kuznets curve in China. And finally, the so-called carbon turning point. This is the main point of this uh, uh, my speech. And, and I will give uh, you some uh, new information about uh, China's uh, strategy for climate change. This is a very hot issue, very important issue, because uh, in November this year, there was another conference we were holding in Cancun. Uh, so Chinese government is prepared something, and I, I got some information. I will uh, share your information uh, with you. The first part, turning point is uh, industrial structure turning points. Uh, according to uh, some uh, statistics or uh, forecast uh, by uh, DRC, that's uh, Professor Zhang uh, uh, came from. The shares of second industry uh, in GDP will decline after 2030. So still have 20 years to do. That means that the industry structure, especially manufacturing, still be the main part of Chinese industry. Okay? And the ratio of urbanization in China will get to 70% in the next 30, uh, 20 years. So this is uh, a graph uh, showing the relationship between industrialization and urbanization in China. We can see this very, very close relation. And also we can see that urbanization in China is uh, growing very, very rapidly. In 1970s, uh, 1978, there was only, the ratio was only 17%. But now you can see roughly 47%. Okay, so the urbanization in China is very, very rapidly spreaded. And also, the urban employee are in increasing very rapidly, including migrants. But here you can see a very, very big gap here. The migrant is not counted here in, in urban employee. That is a question, that's a problem. So what happens if this kind of stru uh, structure change uh, uh, in the next uh, 20 years? Firstly, Industrial structure turning point will be arrived in after or after 2030. This is, uh, you know, uh, uh, based on some uh, focus on aesthetics. Secondly, labor migration will be, will continue for many years. So because uh, this this morning, uh, Meng Xin uh, reported his uh, uh, her uh, newest uh, 
uh, survey uh, result uh, showing that uh, there are still a lot uh, surplus labor in agriculture sector. So migration will be continued. And also uh, environment pollution will be get worse. So I will show you uh, the, the data later. And finally, uh, for a CO2 emission will increase in the next 20 years. Even though the Chinese government, Chinese leader promised to cut off 20, uh, 40 to 45% unit emission of CO2 in 2020, but the total amount of CO2 emission will increase in the next 20 years. This is a very serious problem. The Lewis point, the turning point, and here I give you a, a structure that uh, it's a very hard issue that uh, uh, Professor Cai Fang in China, he said that China is approaching to the turning point, Louis uh, turning point. But I, I may show you this as a structure. The red line is uh, the so-called urban uh, uh, rural income gap. This gap is something we learned from Louis model that because we have this kind of gap, that migrant can move from agricultural sector to manufacturing sector because of the income gap. This is a main polling uh, uh, you know, driving force, something like that. So we can see from this figure that the ratio reached to 3.3 times in 19, uh, 2009, still increasing. So the income between rural area and urban area still income is, is enlarging. Enlarging. So migrant will still uh, continue to uh, move uh, to the cities. Now also we can see that migrant works increased very fast since uh, 1987 to now. So uh, according to uh, one uh, survey uh, by, made by uh, the Ministry of Agriculture that uh, in 2009 roughly uh, 105, uh, 115 million uh, migrant are working in cities. So this is a big number. Why the people want to move? Because this kind of gap. So income distribution or income inequality is closely uh, uh, linked to the migrant issues. And then what is the meaning of the industrial urbanization? The people move to urban area, they need food, they need a uh, house, they need cars, they need the you know, route. So this kind of thing will increase the so-called uh, uh, CO2 emission in China. So urbanization is very closely relating to uh, a CO2 emission. Then, uh, so whether China is now approaching to the Lewis uh, uh, migration, uh, labor migration uh, term point, I give you some uh, new list, uh, 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 information. Uh, you may hear from news that uh, strikes are breaking uh, out in South, East, and North China, and especially in coastal area. And uh, I just hear news that uh, the Japanese company, uh, Toyota, uh, Nissan, has stopped their production in, in, in the coastal area because the strike uh, effect. So why? Because uh, the, the workers want to have higher in wage because they have, we are human beings, we want to compare not our parents, not some residents in hometown. We want to compare our living standard with Japanese, with uh, Americans. So why we, should we have a so low a wage? They, they want to have a, the same thing like a civil rights or human rights. This is uh, something happening in China. And also, uh, in, in, uh, inside of the government side, the uh, government raised wage uh, you know, by uh, some sort of minimum uh, uh, wage system. For example, in June uh, this year, uh, last year, the minimum, minimum, uh, minimum wage raised to uh, 960 in Beijing. And in Shenzhen, that is uh, uh, China's special economic zone, over 1,000 uh, renminbi. And Shanghai, the highest uh, level of uh, 1,120 uh, renminbi. So China, that the rich level in China will raise, continue from now. And I just hear from my friend, he's ma they are making uh, the, the, the proposal for the uh, 12, uh, five years uh, plan of the next uh, launch from next year. That's a Chinese government will launch a kind of a income doubling uh, plan, like something happened in uh, the 1960s in Japan. 
So the wage, uh, average income will grow, will grow, some spelling will, will at 15% annually. This is a greater, a uh, very, 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 very big number. In Japan, I'm a professor, my salary is declining every year <laughs> because government wants to cut budget. But in China, some people, my, my age, they are richer than me. <laughs> so their rich is uh, you, you know, increasing. So this is uh, something that happens. The labor shortage issue is spreading from coastal area to inland area. But I mean, because the time limits, I have no time to explain that. This is very special, uh, you know, things happen. Because the government wants to protect uh, the human rights or civil rights of migrants. So purposely, um, purposely, they rise the minimum wage. This is one reason. Now, and also, the, you know, the inland China, the agricultural reform or the Western uh, development project uh, give uh, many chance to young people to work there to have a higher income. That is the right reason. Okay. So this kind of thing what happens. So what is the turning point of Louis' uh, labor migration? I, I have uh, two uh, projections. One is uh, which level will increase uh, by 30% in the next five years. This is according to uh, the draft of uh, government uh, uh, proposal for the uh, 12 five years plan. Projection two, the lowest turning point of labor migration might be appears in 2000, uh, 2015 to 2020. Okay. So the question is what, what will happen to, China, to the Chinese economy after the lowest point? China is uh, now became the world factory because he, many multinational company came to China using cheap labor. This is the uh, most uh, you know, uh, uh, important weapons for Chinese economy. But if China loses this kind of a cheap labor advantage, what Chinese economy will happen? So that is a problem. Uh, uh, the third turning point is uh, so-called Kuznets turning point, income. Uh, we can show, uh, I can just show you this uh, graph. This is uh, uh, Gini coefficient uh, by years from uh, uh, 1978 to 2008, uh, 2009. So the nationwide Gini coefficient uh, reached to uh, 0.48. Uh, uh, it's very high. Uh, I, according to my international comparison, it's just behind the South Africa or something other countries. It's a very high level. And especially rural uh, Gini coefficient is very high in China. <laughs> so some people ask uh, when China can be an equal society. I think it's a long time. Maybe in 20, 30, 50 years, something happened in Japan. So it, it is very, very, very difficult to, for, for, for Chinese people to have an equal society, equal income. But this is also a kind of a dispute. Some people said this is good for Chinese economy because we can use cheap labor, use the gap between rural and urban to uh, attract labor force, to use the labor force. Okay, but. The question is that how long it will be return, they will continue. So China will face a dilemma: reduce income gap by rising or by rising average wage. This is uh, something now in current China is doing because now it's a hot uh, issue in China, or lose its advantage of cheap labor. So this is very difficult to things to face. Okay, uh, fifth one, uh, fourth one is environment Kuznet curve. Uh, 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 some people, uh, Hu and uh, Zhong Xiang, uh, showed uh, something already. And here is uh, uh, SO2 emission of China. It is a uh, uh, typical uh, Kuznet curve of China. Uh, I use uh, real data, whether you believe or not, but it's, uh, uh, I think it's from the studies books of China. So we can see that uh, this kind of trend is continuing. So the Chinese uh, Kuznet curve has not reached to its peak yet. That means the environment issue in China will be worse continually. And also China need to do more of efforts to, to deal with the environment issue. Finally, the carbon turning points. It is our main point of the uh, speech. I have three minutes. Believe it or not, it is something uh, said by the chairman the vice chairman, he is now chairman of a Toyota company, Watanabe. He gave a speech, we invited, we invited him to give a speech at Nanguya University last year, and he said something very surprised. In the past, 
Toyota company had made cars for American because designed for American and produced for American. Now, from now on, Toyota company will make cars for Chinese because Chinese people is becoming rich. What this means? Two things. One is that the rising Chinese economy will restructure the world economy. Chinese economy will be the leader of the Asian economy in the next 20 years, maybe 50 years. And two, CO2 emission in China will increase as well as become a modernization society. Chinese people have a dream to have a car, not Japanese car, a German car or, or American car, big car, it's stronger. And also have a German furniture, Japanese wife or something like that. So, okay. So that is a Chinese dream, like, um, like American dream. So this is very, very, very interesting thing, so that, uh, that something happens in, in Japan in 1970s, now same, same thing happens in, in, in China. So this is kind of thing, we are increase the carbon emission in China. This is a real data, we, uh, we calculated from uh, uh, data from uh, uh, IPCC and also an uh, international energy uh, agency. So the carbon coolness curve had not reached to its peak yet. Okay. That means that China's uh, uh, carbon emission will increase in the next uh, 20 years. And also, finally, I may say that uh, China's strategy for climate change, I may use uh, some uh, you know, words you may be surprised. Uh, before the Copenhagen summit talk, it was a good thing, a great leap forward before the Copenhagen talk because Chinese come promised to cut, cut off carbon emission very actively. And also Japanese government promised to cut off 25%. Uh, it's a big member. But after the talk, after Copenhagen, there's a big uh, uh, leak, uh, not forward, but uh, a, a kind of a uh, uh, backward, back to the before, back to the before. Because Japanese government said, we promised, yes, that's right, but that's uh, conditional. By condition, if China, India, and other country reduced, we, we can follow. But if they do, we do not. That is something. And also other countries, yeah, like, like China said that, before that talks, uh, Wen Jiaobao said, we will develop the so-called low carbon economy. Low carbon economy is a bigger idea, bigger structure. But uh, in the uh, Congress uh, meeting this year, May, May in, in, in March, uh, Wen Jiabao said, we have developed low carbon technology. From economy to technology, the big change, big change. So Chinese government or the top leader maybe said, oh, what, we are confused. Maybe you are trapped. The letter set by for China. It's a trap. You, you please, please come in. But you have to check. This is uh, something we, we are treated. So this, uh, I, I think that uh, Copenhagen is failed. It's not good. So we need a uh, a new talk again. So that is, uh, we may have a start. And uh, according to our uh, study uh, using, uh, the, uh, based on a Kaya model, it's a Japanese uh, professor. And uh, if Chinese government promised to cut off 20, uh, 40 to 45 uh, percent per capita GDP uh, uh, reduction, but the total emission of China's em uh, carbon, carbon uh, emission will be increased. Uh, up, up to 163 percent. It is a big member. So totally will be increased. But the good thing is that uh, Chinese uh, government and Chinese people are doing something that's very good. Uh, as uh, uh, Professor Ross Gunner said, said yesterday, China, Chinese do something very good, but the, the, worldwide, the world does not know that. So China, China should integrate itself to the world. That is a good, 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 good idea. Uh, China has uh, launched a national development plan and, and, uh, and uh, established many laws about local carbon development already. Uh, now it's now under uh, you know, uh, discussion that uh, main target in the 12th five years development plan, uh, something like this, they'll make a low carbon green development plan. So the new uh, five years plan will be a green, uh, green one and change the industrial structure and improve the share of uh, territory to 50% in GDP, and 20% uh, carbon reduction. 
This is a very confused thing because Chinese government said we have done something already uh, in the uh, fifth, uh, uh, eleventh uh, five years uh, the plan, but that's uh, not true because that is uh, targeted uh, and receiving and also SO2 emission, not CO2 emission. So, but next five year plan, Chinese government will launch a new one, your new one. That's a CO2 emission direction. This is a good thing. And also increased share of uh, new renewable uh, energy, uh, developed uh, new energy and low carbon uh, technology, set an adjust, uh, uh, administration, uh, administrative measure for local governor to appreciate local officers by the index of environment protection and carbon, uh, carbon relation, uh, reduction. This is very, very, very important because uh, Dong Sheng uh, talked t t this morning that the local government has its own way only way to, to do something. So uh, they, sometimes they don't listen to central government. This is a very, 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 very hard uh, target. And then finally, uh, local uh, actions toward the lo 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 low carbon economy. Low carbon development strategy has been uh, spread in, in China widely. And the low carbon city boom is happening in China. Many, many cities want to be a low carbon city. And also low carbon economic zone has been under discussion. For example, Chongming Island in Shanghai, Tianjin, low carbon eco industrial park is under construction. The world's largest wind power field, solar power system, new energy model cities, uh, Tulufan in Xinjiang, will be the new uh, uh, energy model city in the next uh, uh, five years. And also, low carbon industry is booming in China. So I may, uh, you know, not promise, but I'm uh, very happy to hear this kind of thing, that uh, the China is uh, the biggest uh, uh, emitter of CO2 emission in the world, but China is doing something. So I just uh, said I'm not uh, uh, want to defend the, the Chinese government position. I just want to say uh, do not push too hard on China, but help China and cooperate with China so we can have a bright future, we can build a low carbon economy in the future. Thank you. Thanks, Jinjun. I think economists prove that setting targets and achieving them are two very different things. The target of 20 minutes each, and each person thinks, I'll just do a little bit more. Um, but anyway, I'm going to eat into afternoon tea, partly because in the next session I noticed there are three speakers from the ANU and so they've only travelled hundreds of metres to get here today. Um, they, they might take that hint. Let's just see if there are any questions. Yeah, you, there's, if the speakers want to come up, oh, unless everyone's really hungry, but surely there are some questions for one of these, or all, all three of them today. Uh, just a question, trying to link the environmental and the economics together. Uh, in referring to Hugh's paper, the, uh, this issue of um, the, uh, the intensity of, uh, of steel use, um, with China being such a big economy and with the environmental Im imprint of China being so great, does that impact at all your, uh, your results? Or have you tried to take that into account in your, in your analysis? Uh, thanks, Paul. Uh, now, yes, we have, uh, but uh, it's, it's really implicit. Um, the uh, technique that we use to uh, sort of model steel demand simultaneously with modelling GDP per capita, it's in that uh, second phase where we capture that effect indirectly. And uh, the way we think about uh, the structure of the economy unfolding uh, and what that does to our, um, our estimate of GDP per capita feeds back in uh, to the estimate of steel demand per capita. Uh, but I would say that when you are looking at uh, long-term forecasts or projections, uh, dealing with structural change is the, the most difficult thing. Uh, it's very easy to... Uh, just uh, push it off to the side, but I, you're absolutely right. It's something that has to be addressed. And uh, 
probably uh, the last portion of my presentation is sort of just sort of touched on it, and that's the distribution of income inside the economy between uh, various segments, and uh, particularly the uh, bringing income distribution back in the direction of labour and away from capital. Uh, once you start to think about subsidising capital to a lesser degree, suddenly you start to price resources more effectively. And that is really uh, the... It's not a silver bullet, but uh, if you start uh, charging end users uh, economic value for resources, that will impact their demand uh, more, uh, more uh, reliably than anything else. So implicitly we cover it, but it's not something which we've actually uh, hard keyed into the study. Thanks. Um, I want to ask Zhong Xiang and also Professor Xu. Um, we know in 2006 the government required all the provinces to reduce the intensity, the energy intensity by 4% and also reduce the um, discharge of the major pollutants by 2%. But at the end of that year, only two, prov only two provinces have reached the targets. So we think that the intention and the implement, implementation is really a big gap in China. So in 2009, the government promised the reduction of the carbon intensity of GDP by 14 to 45 percent. So I want to know what do you read the intention between, behind the promises and what do you expect of the ex implementation? Really, thanks. Uh, thank you very much, and also give me another opportunity to, to speak, comment a little bit more, which actually in my papers. Uh, basically, you know, is the government uh, uh, have this uh, carbon intensity built in the, in the five national year plan, and it was actually announced 2006 and March in the National People Congress. And one year later, uh, 2007, and uh, the first time, and also Prime Minister Wen Jiabo and the public apologize that we didn't meet the target. Basically, if you want to reduce 20% target, it basically requires annualized 4.4. .4. And, uh, and they actually only set 4% per year for that year. But that year only achieved like 1.79% for the country as a whole. Actually, there is only one province meeting that target, that is Beijing. And then the second one is Shanghai, 3.9 something. And Beijing is only one over than, 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 than the, the and, uh, and all the years from the nine, uh, if you take the 4.4 as an annualized target to meet the 20%, for the last four years, only one year showed that goal, that is the 2008. That, to large extent, I also contribute really to this, uh, you know, slowdown of world economics and the financial crisis. And, but anyhow, this is, uh, you know, the you know, Prime Minister and the government as a whole still consider this hard to commit to the government, uh, to, the, to the countries. Then from this year, you will see from now on to end of year, government will take very, very harsh measures, which you never think about. We will, you know, close anything as possible to meet that target. It's very not economic rational, but anyhow, they just want to shoot that target. And that is, uh, actually, this should be due in the early years, but no, because now it's only half a year left, and if you look at what has been achieved in before, for the last four years, for China achieved energy intensity reduction, 40. 40.38. So that means if you want to meet the 20% reduction this year, you have to achieve 5.6 more. But in the first quarters, actually, is a 3.0% increase. So that means for this year, if you want to meet the 20% reductions, probably we need at least 6% reduction, more than 6% to get it done. So that would be very, very hard. But anyhow, it is, uh, so that was what's what going on uh, currently. But this uh, energy intensity, carbon intensity target, that is basically built on what we before, and, uh, and, and uh, this is how nothing, although of course is, uh, it is uh, pronounced in the Copenhagen, but actually to some extent is not particularly related to 
you know, the climate education basically means, uh, you know, China, based on their economic development, based on what energy supply we have and economic growth. And if you want to, you know, achieve your economic growth and with the uh, kind of domestic energy supply potential import from all you from outside, you set this kind of energy intensive target, then they have some fixed coefficient that they can convert to carbon intensive. That was the, 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 the do. And uh, so it is uh, if the over time, the government constantly implement the policy that will be achieved. But if the government always fluctuation, for example, like uh, last year was financial crisis, and uh, many governors and the Secretary General Province tell the company, you know, you will get a differentiation in the uh, electricity tariff as long as you're, you, know, you're, you let your manufacturing operation. But this year, then the central government uh, said that we would, did not meet the target. The Prime Minister and Secretary General and the first uh, Secretary General, they bring all the you know, governors, the Secretary General, to the central, com central party school in Beijing. Very, very rare. And then tell them, you have to change your practice last year. You know. But that is, uh, you, know, you already told the company, you build this, build this, but now you let them go. So that reason, you see, from now is very hard. But, was, but what I'm trying to emphasize, government should have your policy implemented constantly. This target would be, would be made. Uh, I may give a funny answer. So the target can be realized. Uh, impossible or possible. Why? Uh, according to our calculation, according to experts' calculation, it is impossible to get the, the target by the end of the year. Because last year, the, the financial crisis hit China, and the Chinese government launched a, a great deal, a green deal, to uh, encourage uh, our recovery industry. So let's uh, spend a lot of money on that. Also, the CO2 emission increased a lot last year. So, uh, according to our <laughs> experts, uh, estimation is not possible. It's not possible to reach that goal. But it also is possible in politics. Because primary, uh, primary uh, minister Wen Jiabao promised that by the end of the year, if that party has not realized, he will resign. Resign. That is a very hard work. So he may push the local government. Please do that on purpose. Okay. So what is that on purpose? So the local government says, "Oh, no, pro no, no problem. By the end of the year, we will get the target. Target. But how can they get it? I don't know." Not, not that. Maybe something happens in static states. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll take, we just have two more questions and then we'll break for afternoon tea. Um, yeah, so uh, it, it's obvious that China is making a huge uh, effort to uh, deal with its environmental problems, but still on balance, uh, it seems that it's falling behind. It's not, uh, uh, so carbon emissions are still rising, SO2 emissions are still rising. I'm just wondering whether one of the big turning points is going to be an environmental catastrophe in, uh, uh, in China. Already there are major groundwater shortages, drought problems, uh, air pollution uh, issues. Uh, your, your forecast was for CO2 emissions to rise by 160 something percent, even with even if you hit these emission intensity uh, uh, targets. Um, I mean, everyone is kind of optimistic and assuming that somehow things are going to roll along and that adjustments are going to occur. But it seems to me a very serious question whether, in fact, environmental constraints aren't going to come and really bite into uh, China's uh, future development uh, prospects somewhere in the next uh, 10 or 20 years. Just a, a comment or a question to the panel. Oh, can I just quickly comment that not everyone's, definitely not everyone's optimistic. Um, Wing Tai Wu spoke this morning about the environmental pressures as possibly being one of the big power supply failures and probably the most challenging issue for the Chinese leadership to face. But certainly the evidence presented today does look like they are fighting a losing battle. Um, also, Jin Jun wasn't entirely optimistic when he said, truthfully, the, re you know, the reality is that they're going to fail in meeting at least one of the targets that they're trying to reach. But I'll see what <coughs> I'm going to say, uh, uh, I'm going to say, don't worry about that. 
worry. Yeah, uh, because uh, the Chinese way to do economic growth or reform is something that called top down. That means central government is still very strong. They do something very suddenly. For example, to uh, change the currency curve, maybe in five years, ten years, by turning off thousands, thousands of small factories. <laughs> this is something with the military command. You have to close your factory because you emitted too much CO2 or SO2. So that is the Chinese way to do that. So suddenly that, cha that curve changed. It's not something surprise. So I, I am a part of it. <laughs> <promise. laughs> The last question up there. Yes. Well, thank you all for a very informative uh, overview. I'm just interested if we look at, uh, say, there's a problem with China getting access to energy resources, be that in the source countries for oil, coal, these kind of things, if it's along the sea lines of communication, what impact do you expect that would have? Do you see a rapid increase in moving away from uh, high carbon industries? Do you see a shift in some way in the way in which the government would look at its international relationships? Um, that's pretty much out to the whole panel. Just interested in general views there with your projections. I'd like to very quickly come back to the issue you both to raise. I, I forgot to mention. I would like to give the Chinese government some credit. Is uh, you know what I'm talking about the really focus on energy saving intensity target. For that one, if you look at what's going on now, it looks like it's very hard to meet by the end of 2010 if they don't take very harsh uh, measures. But uh, but on the other hand, I would like to give credit is, uh, because in the first uh, 11 five-year plan, there are two targets. One is an intensity, another is a pollution car, 10% for SO2 and 10% reduction for COD, which are basically for the polluted waters. And for that two target, basically China already met by end of last year. Basically means in terms of CO2, actually the total amount, not the relative unit, the total amount actually already below than what before. So that was last year actually already met, or more or less already met the target. So basically it means in terms of local pollutions, you know, which usually we talk about air pollutions, particularly like ice and rains, and the water pollution which is measured by COD. So this is, a, there are some positive signs in current news because this is the case. But for the global pollutant, which is measured like CO2, that will be different. And regarding this, uh, uh, you know, is uh, you know the energy securities, and uh, you know this is certainly the issues. And China certainly all these years, how this kind of the, uh, you know diplomat, uh, so-called is oil diplomacy towards uh, Africa, towards uh, South Americans, and uh, particular come to the state which is Western Washington D.C. and Brazil consider is, uh, you know, is a country don't consider supposed to be have the relationship with them. And, uh, but the point is here is, you know, is when you want to, want to reduce the mission, the economics, you have to fill the by the, uh, f uh, you, know, uh, you know, China now is uh, energy consumption, uh, almost 75% uh, uh, is from coal. So if you want to reduce the emissions, uh, there are several ways of, one is, uh, you know, you're trying to use less coal and to, towards the more oil and uh, more gas, and, and the long term, then you have more and more uh, renewable energy, particularly this, uh, you know, the CCS and, and so on. But the other hand, they, you know, but if you want to use more oils, and then you come to this kind of question that because those days, all oh, this new uh, easy op, uh, oil field, which actually already, already, already be, you know, is considered as a territory for some, somebody else, and that is the leave China as a late entrance Nowhere, to be honestly, go some other options in Africa and then so on. But what I'm seeing, what I, uh, you know, I wrote one paper one time in the Far East Economic Review to dealing with energy security and look at how China is doing. For me, is I, my general is, uh, argument here is uh, this is, uh, you know, the region is very sensitive. So when China to go there and this sometimes you really have to take a certain concerns from Brussels and DC because sometimes this kind of the human run issues and you know in some areas it really go out of control you have to a little bit consider this another thing for china probably for china should uh, probably china should think about is trying to team up you know the china national corporation oil use not don't always think about you will want to get a contract on your own trying to team up with the major you know majors in the in the global majors, you know, shells and the BPs, you know, all these things, 
get it together so that understands and uh, you, you know, then you get less this kind of political concern. But generally speaking, China should be more sensitive than it used to be because uh, before, the, uh, before the Obama administration, that time the U.S. doesn't much come to Africa. But those days, you know, when the Obama come to, come to stage, actually the very early years they already come to, come to Africa, they want to build more leadership. And this, and now is getting more and more sensitive. So in that sense, I would say that the country should be more cautious when it comes to this kind of issues. But certainly this is where, you know, probably still have some oil which more country can, can be explored. Right, so just to address that sort of that hypothetical in a slightly different way, um, and also to talk about this uh, environmental catastrophe, I, I don't think we should, you know, be beating China up for not having a recession in 2009. Uh, the rest of the world had their uh, demand for uh, fossil fuels fall in 2009 because their economies contracted violently and uh, they put millions out of work. China took a very pragmatic short-term decision, but I don't think we should then extrapolate that forward as a uh, long-run strategy. In terms of uh, supply in the long run, uh, I think the key here is uh, that resources companies are convinced about the uh, long-run growth of emerging markets and the resource intensity of that growth. Now, 10 years ago, they weren't convinced. And that's one of the reasons why commodity prices move so dramatically through the middle part of this decade and up to 2008, because the supply was really battling to keep up with the demand because of the immense time lags which are involved. But as I said, the resource companies are convinced. They're looking in all four corners of the globe for, uh, for resources. And uh, yes, Chinese demands are going to be there. Uh, the rest of the world is going to recover eventually, so their demand for fossil fuels is going to rebalance and uh, China will have some competition uh, for these resources. But uh, I'm quite optimistic on supply. Uh, the only uh, caveat I would put upon that is that uh, the capital to develop very large projects uh, is going to be quite scarce for the next half decade, possibly the next whole decade, uh, because of the uh, terrible state of the global financial system, uh, mobilising large amounts of capital uh, for very long-term projects uh, is no given. But certainly the resources companies are going to be uh, doing their very best uh, to increase supply dramatically. Uh, and they, but they will be still expecting prices to rise, even if they can bring uh, tremendous supply to the market. Thank you. I think we'll call it a session over there. We'll take a, well, I'll, I'll ask you to come back at 20 past, because I know that you'll ignore that, and, and be back here by half past at the latest to get started on the final session. Thanks.